Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Gerard Toll and uh, this is a lecture in my graduate course at Virginia Tech, Topics in Political Geography, that I'm teaching in the spring of 2017. The subject of this lecture is the book, The Theatre of Operations, which um, is by Joseph Masco. Uh, subtitle of the book, National Security Affect from the Cold War to the War on Terror. This, published, this book was published by Duke University Press in 2014. Duke University Press is known for publishing um, critical theory and uh, some of the most innovative uh, thinkers in uh, the United States today. I really like this book a lot. And um, I think it's a very, very important book. It's a very rich book. And it's a difficult book, I think, for those of you who may not be familiar with this style of writing. Let me talk a little bit about what the book is about and begin with Masco's own description of what the book is about on page 41. And there's a long introduction, as you know, to the book. The Theory of Operations investigates the cultural logics technological fears and political ambitions that had to be in place for a, in brackets, literally nonsensical war on terror to be thinkable. It traces how the Cold War balance of terror was remade into a war on terror as a means of extending American hegemony into the 21st century. The book traces the remaking of the nuclear security state as a counter-terror state and assesses the resulting shifts in a variety of domains of American national security culture enabled by the politics of shock. It theorizes a new modality of citizen-state relations mediated by a shock, terror, normality circuit that produces two things. The promise of a world without events that is perfectly secure every day, unbroken by surprise, and with the inevitable failure of that project, the continued drive to expand the security project in the name of producing a world without shock. The circuit is a key feature, not only in defining a national security state after World War II, it also helps explain why non-militarized threats relating to climate, finance, domestic infrastructure and health fail to rise to the level of a national security problem despite the widespread destruction and terrors that they produce. To this end, the theory of operations addresses the following questions. How does a nuclear hyperpower, perhaps the most secure and powerful state in human history, come to embrace vulnerability and fear as the basis for its political order? How does a country commit to a permanent war posture grounded in covert actions, existential threat and preemption while maintaining an ideology of openness, law and democracy? And finally, how does a society define and limit its security project when the future is anticipated to be filled with emerging terrors, presenting a proliferating field of objects and spaces to be militarized in the endless pursuit of defense. Now that is a, a really lovely description of the book. It condenses and captures so much uh, about this book. Um, so let's talk a little bit of where the, about where the book comes from and about some of those ideas that are expressed here. First of all, um, Masco uh, is a graduate of uh, University of San Diego. Uh, he's an anthropologist. He's a professor at the University of Chicago currently. Um, and his work is part of a long tradition uh, in anthropology and in associated fields that examines war. Uh, you will see from his book that it is heavily um, informed by a really wide reading in social theory and cultural theory. So this is really a remarkable multidisciplinary book in that he um, does historical research, he works in the archives, uh, yet he's extremely well read in a social theory and in um, a contemporary American studies. 
Um, his work addresses science, technology, and affect. Uh, and he's part of uh, a, a core group of uh, anthropologists and social, critical social scientists that have addressed these particular questions uh, for a long time. Their interest is in the question of expertise. Uh, how is expertise produced? Uh, it's in the question of training and then socialization. And those are all kind of long-standing uh, themes in um in sociology as well as anthropology. Now the anthropology, uh, it may seem kind of strange that anthropology studies the other uh, and studies kind of primitive societies. Well, in one sense, the anthropological gaze is turned on our own society and he looks at our own society in the way that, let's say, Carl Cohen does in her essay the, uh, on death and uh, defense intellectuals, uh, sex and death and defense intellectuals. Um, it, and it makes strange the particular nature of our society. So that uh, discussion, the nonsensical, is uh, you have to sort of step outside of our own culture um, in order to appreciate what it is that he's trying to say. Uh, and his position is that our society is really very strange in lots of ways. It is a primitive society of various sorts with its particular rituals and its uh, sets of um, um, chiefs uh, exp who have expertise and magic associated with them. There are rituals of uh, involving emotion and collective affect. Uh, there are uh, um, objects and relics which are endowed with special magical powers. There's a certain aesthetics in the society. There's spectacle. There's notions of awe. There's technological sublimes. There's a memory and so on and so forth. That comes from the anthropological training. And so that's what he brings. And that's what makes it so kind of fascinating and interesting is that he describes our contemporary world in a way that is familiar to us, but it's also outside uh, in that it is informed by an understanding that it could be very different. It could and should be, especially given the particular creeds of the society, the society of freedom, of liberty, and so on and so, so forth that he discusses, is actually a society dominated by fear and dominated by secrecy and dominated by uh, an obtrusive, uh, militarized government. Why? How did that happen? So he's examining um, kind of classic themes in anthropology, except that we are the uh, weird uh, primitive society that is under investigation. Now, his work is part of, uh, like I mentioned, a, a tradition of uh, research on America in the 20th century, uh, particularly post-Cold War period, the so-called American century, um, and the making of uh, um, America as a superpower, the United States as a superpower, which wasn't uh, true in the past. And uh, how, how did this happen? And how did we get the development of military industrial complex, the development of uh, uh, an atomic society? Gary Wills talks about bomb power and what that did to our constitution. So here are some works that uh, he cites and that uh, have informed him. Uh, Hugh Gusterson, uh, who's currently at uh, George Mason University, um, has written on this uh, issue too. So has Paul Edwards, who's cited in the, um, in the acknowledgments of this book. Um, and then the geographer Matthew Farish has a really uh, excellent book on some of the same themes as the emergence of this techno-scientific uh, world, a uh, security state uh, coming out of World War II uh, and then it's shaping of uh, the culture more broadly and it's a shaping of America's entanglement with the world. While it nevertheless is a range of space within the United States in very interesting ways. So the state of Nevada essentially becomes a military training uh, and weapons complex state with the exception of Las Vegas. So, so there's 
there's a, there's the fantasy space of Las Vegas, and then there's the uh, the nuclear testing uh, space of uh, Santa Fe and, and elsewhere, uh, and um, Los Alamos and the like. And of course, uh, it, this extends into California and uh, now around the country because of the nature of uh, congressional appropriations for uh, military uh, weapons of one type and another. Now, this is part of, bro- more broadly, uh, a look at uh, the ways in which, m- from World War II, you had a terror uh, be part of everyday advanced industrial society. Um, World War II was described as total war, so the keep calm and carry on that I have uh, there from World War II was an effort by the British state to manage the terror that was the Blitz. And the United States faced a similar threat. You have existentially threatening weapons that are developed at the end of World War II and even you know, without the development of the nuclear weapon, of course, firebombing over Dresden and, uh, and Tokyo uh, produced massive amounts of casualties. And so those who were ex- existential threats to, to, uh, to cities. Cities could be obliterated by a modern uh, a mass bombing, uh, and therefore, what do you? What does? How does that? What does that do to a society? A society uh, that is uh, aware of that potential, and what should a state do in order to try to prepare for that? So that's how the um, the prospect, the shadow of the nuclear weapon, the shadow of the bomb really shapes the post-Cold War period and then how that then jumps from being a containment of communism to be containment of terrorism. So counter-communist to counter-terrorist state. What unites all of these is the sense of a state of emergency. Now there are various ways in which sociologists and others have described the post-Cold War period uh, or the, no, the post-World War II period. Um, so the German sociologist Ulrich Beck talks about risk society and the development of risk society. The Anthropocene is a term that is now used to describe a new geological era in human um, development, um, uh, which is marked by uh, the trace of uh, radioactive materials in the geological record uh, and the trace of man's impact. Um, and he discusses the open uh, air testing in the 1940s and the 1950s and the legacy of that. All of this is to say, from World War II onwards, the state, advanced industrial states, especially the United States, but also Britain and, and states in Europe and uh, Soviet Union, Russia, existed in this condition uh, of existential threat. And so there was, to a certain extent, a state of emergency. Uh, and so the structures that were put together in World War II, uh, which created Pax Americana, which created the United Nations, which created uh, the American Empire and the American Century, and then had artifacts, uh, techno-scientific artifacts of destruction associated with that, began with World War II, uh, and then uh, it morphed into the Cold War state. Um, so I've just identified some here. The, uh, the atomic bomb comes out of World War II and the Cold War state, which uh, is really stood up in the 1940s and the early 1950s. The Truman Doctrine of March 1947, the 1947 National Security Act, uh, NSC 68, which is in, uh, in 1950, uh, and uh, as a sort of... Uh, um, or an articulation of what needs to be the grand strategy of the United States, which is sort of a planetary-wide containment of communism, um, and and more than containment, sort of a, a aggressively pushing to extend the the um, the domain of uh, freedom as it uh, understood it, 
Um, you have the development of the H-bomb, ICBM uh, technology in, in this particular era. And then you have the counter-state uh, developing in 2000, counter-terror state developing in 2001 with the global war on terror, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the development of um, new legal structures to support this um, uh, counter-terrorist state, the Patriot Act, the authorization for the use of military force, uh, ongoing open-ended authorization, and you have uh, a, a number of the particular technological uh, artifacts that are part of uh, our world, that sort of techno-scientific systems that uh, are part of the waging of uh, this war and the production of uh, security. So each iteration of this emergency state had its own globalism, its own institutional forms, its own forms of enemy ship, uh, its own imperatives, its own uh, cultural filmic heroes and filmic expressions. Um, but what you have uh, overall and what he's examining is the self-fashioning by the United States through scientific, through technoscience and threat projection. Uh, of it, uh, its own role in the world. Now, there, this um, leads to um, a, a state which is deeply militarized and deeply militaristic. And that's a, a concern of his because, of course, the United States was formed deliberately to try to uh, avoid having to have a standing army and so on and so forth. And it was uh, a republic of liberty. Um, and what you have created in the post cold, uh, the post World War II period, uh, and particularly in the contemporary period, is one where the threat is boundless, where the, uh, the, a glo it's a global war on terror. Uh, it is uh, so it's spatially it's planetary and actually post planetary it's it also goes into the atmosphere uh, or into space it's endless in that it uh, doesn't seem like that there's going to be any declaration when uh, the global war on terror is over declared as over uh, it is an, a notion of the future which is predicated on the conditional. Uh, it's, it is the what if this happens. It's sort of a whole set of scenarios and uh, worst case uh, scenarios define the particular condition that we're living in. So we live in the present by being overshadowed by the conditional. Uh, and that, that's sort of the worst case scenario determines what it is that's possible in the present. So this involves a tremendous social societal conditioning and, and really the colonization of everyday life by these, this particular fear and this particular uh, perceived sense of emergency. So it's, uh, this state is seen as imperative, it's necessary, it's unquestioned. And anyone who does so uh, is seen as being beyond the bounds, as being... Um, uh, outside of the society, questioning the society, questioning the community. And therefore, uh, you know, going back to the anthropological um, a particular scene, uh, cast out of the society and uh, therefore subject to censure and subject to humiliation and uh, subject to imprisonment and so on and so forth by not playing by the rules of this society, by releasing secrets and, and so on and so forth. Um, so he is interested in the ways in which this counter-terror state coexists with um, a world of actually existing dangers, risks, insecurities. Um, and there is this notion of uh, an intensifying experience of precarity, of uh, uh, vulnerability in our contemporary period, um, which the counter-terror state has a very interesting relationship to, in that as much as he argues it, the counter-terrorism state in sucking up all the resources of the society um, increases this precarity, yet it also colonizes it 
too. So the things he, he points out are that are actually, and it's a theme that goes through the book, real concerns about employment, about education, about rule of law, about public health failures and uh, about liberty, democracy and freedom, uh, public infrastructures that need to uh, be uh, renewed, um, about emergency management for um, uh, climate change and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, all of these are neglected because the counter-terror state takes priority. Uh, so you have this sense of uh, self-colonization, which he describes first on page two. Well, let me just read you that particular section. It's at the bottom. Um, so he says, but the United States is a global hyperpower that increasingly produces the conditions of its own instability, politically, millet, economically, environmentally, and then mobilizes the resulting vulnerability of its citizens and systems to demand an even greater investment in security infrastructures. And then this is the, the uh, key sentence. Counter-terror has thus become recursive and self-colonizing, replacing the social commitment to building a prosperous collective future and a stable international order um, with the project of warding off a field of imagined and emergent dangers. And then he makes the same, or comes back to this particular notion on page 14, uh, when he writes, um, counter-terror thus approaches the American future as both already ruined, a boundless source of violence, and as perfectible, uh, a conceptual universe requiring radical social and technological engineering intervention. Now, one powerful effect of these administrative logics is that demilitarization becomes increasingly impossible to imagine as potential uh, dangers pile up for experts, while citizens feel increasingly insecure with the diversion of funds and psychic energies from everyday welfare to anticipatory defense. Uh, Counter-terror then constitutes itself as an endless horizon, providing a self-justifying rationale for radical expenditures and dangers. And uh, the, the threat as an imaginary engagement to the future is limitless, offering an ever-expanding field of potentials, uh, possibilities and fears of counter-terror uh, counter governance. So that's a, a key theme in this, um, but it comes out of uh, an American concern with uh, the uh, betrayal of American, uh, American ideals. Now, um, what does this particular condition uh, look like affectively? Well, he argues that uh, the, uh, the dominant affect is one of fear, um, uh, it is a fear which haunts the society. Uh, it's a society that is incapable of allowing uh, for events to happen, including bad uh, events to happen. Uh, it is um, the, uh, also a um, society which seeks to colonize uh, everyday life to anticipate and preempt uh, um, the uh, the possibility for uh, terrorist attacks and so on and so forth, or you know, communist uh, influence in the in the past. The the movie Minority Report and the unit on pre crime um, is a sort of dystopian um, articulation of this uh, what he sees as as a, a tendency within the culture writ large. So there's a lack of a positive vision of a collective. Uh, future uh, for the United States. Um, and it's the sense of the American future is both already ruined and perfectible that, that is of interest. Um, the notion of surprise is also important here, is that we cannot allow surprise or the, the counter-terror uh, state seeks to prevent surprise and then it also seeks to visit surprise, shock, and awe on others. So he talks quite a bit about shocks and the ways in which that those were sort of a, a definitive moments in the development of uh, 
this um, these this this state of emergency writ large. Um, so how and why is counterterror become so American? He asks on page three. Um, and so the the research questions that he asks have to do with threat framing, the notion of shock, threat inflation, uh, the ways in which a condition, um, the ways in which terror conditions everyday life, and uh, the development of uh, that from the uh, 1950s onwards, uh, civil defense, and, and so on and so forth. He has a very interesting section where he discusses about excitable subjects and emotional management. Um, and then there's also, so that's a sort of uh, the affect, uh, the collective emotions. Uh, the, the training of bodies and the enrolling of bodies in a, this particular emergency, this particular condition, as well as uh, then talking about infrastructure, the sort of techno science and the particular uh, technological artifacts, the material I infrastructures that are created, the defense systems, the capacities, the gaming of death, the creation of uh, expertise on a certain uh, uh, technological systems and, and sets of emergencies and not others. Um, so that's also part of his argument. Now the book is uh, uh, organized as a, um, a series of different chapters which look at uh, this. So there's the chapter on uh, ruins and the a shadow of the atomic destruction of Hir uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the possibility of that in American cities, the imagining of destruction in American cities, and the attempt to try to uh, create a possible uh, response and the uh, ways in which one could potentially survive a nuclear attack. So you imagine American cities being destroyed, and then you uh, seek to try to imagine uh, ways in which that uh, the American society can reconstitute itself. The uh, discussion uh, in uh, the chapter Bad Weather is about uh, uh, the um, nuclear testing and on its impact on nature. And then he kind of transitions to a discussion of climate change uh, and uh, the ways in which um, you had uh, the cinematic envisioning of a catastrophe. The, the chapter on secrecy looks at the particular protocols, the particular rituals, and rules of the national security state uh, and the ways in which uh, secrecy has expanded tremendously and the ways in which it sort of uh, jumps out of its own uh, rules given certain shock events. So the classify, the uh, secret but unclassified category and the production of that. And again, again think, uh, he's thinking like an anthropologist. How is this possible? How is it possible to think that? What kind of ritual is this? What makes this possible? Um, and then the chapter on biosecurity in the war, dealing with uh, the um, concern with uh, biological weapons of, of various kinds, the discussion of the anthrax attacks, and so on and so forth. Um, overall, this is a terrific book. I really like it a lot. Um, there are, however, certain issues that I would raise for you to think about as you read the book. Um, I, they are problems, or there are certain, if we were to go into greater depth in this, I think one could potentially challenge him on some things. So how evidence is chosen, arranged, and presented. There's a creative um, synthesis that makes this book very, very readable and very uh, productive. But um, there's a juxtaposing of things which actually might be quite different. So that you transition from the discussion of the forest, the nuclear forest that's created uh, to show the, uh, the blast effects of the forest. And there's a discussion of that as a particular visual moment then to uh, Hurricane Katrina and so on and so forth. And that is, um, and there's other instances too, uh, where that transition is uh, not necessarily justified in, in ways that would satisfy more strictly formalist social science. Why are certain movies picked and not other movies? There's no discussion of uh, 
uh, Independence Day, from what I recall. Maybe there's a, a, a little reference to it. Um, so that in and of itself, I mean, there, there are so many hundreds of movies produced every year in the United States. So why pick on these? And, uh, you know, he does justify to a certain extent by saying this was an extremely uh, lucrative film uh, in the book, box office and so on and so forth. But why are these films necessarily um, exem exemplars of uh, the American imagination uh, the collective imagination and not others. Um, so you can challenge him on that. There is a certain tendency uh, towards sweeping statements uh, with no discussion of counter evidence and no discussion of the potential ways in which the, his claims could be falsified. Um, so that I think is a potential weakness uh, where you could actually complicate his uh, discussion. I'll give you one example. So the Cold War state um, ends in, in the kind of communist state ends 1990 theoretically. Uh, so with what's happened in, what's happening from 1990, 1992 to 2001. Um, there's not really much discussion of that. Now, he can make an argument that actually defense spending did not drop and defense spending has continued even though it continued to rise, even though um, there was no existential threat like the Soviet Union um, in that period. But there's no discussion of uh, responsibility to protect uh, and uh, the, the, the concerns of the 1990s. Uh, which were um, which were really important in uh, con reconstituting uh, the U.S. Uh, state, uh, so NATO enlargement and so on and so forth. Thirdly, uh, hyperbole. Is there a, a tendency towards hyperbole in this particular type so this particular type of work? I think that you could make a case that there is in certain places. Fourthly, under specified objects, this sort of reiterates some uh, something that I talked about earlier. So the counter-terror state, without necessarily saying exactly what that is and what it's not. Uh, how does that relate to the welfare state? How does that relate to um, you know the alliance system that the, the U.S. has, and so on and so forth. And the final issue uh, concerns uh, insiders and outsiders, which is. Um, uh, always a dilemma for anthropologists, uh, and that is that um, you know the, he is on the one hand American, and so he is an insider. Yet he is uh, an anthropologist, and therefore seeks to critique and and be an outsider and uh, adopt this position. But to what extent can you do that? Uh, to what extent is he actually articulating certain creeds? notions within the American tradition that he likes, like pre-World War II, the, the founding ideals of the United States, and so on and so forth. Uh, and to what extent, therefore, does that mean that he's been insufficiently attentive to his own subjectivity and his own affects? To what extent is he part himself part of a subculture, which is a sort of uh, uh, the culture of... Um, uh, which has its own aesthetics, actually. So the culture of um, left professors who are um, uh, extremely critical of a militarized state. So this it's got a beautiful the book's got a beautiful cover, as you well know, uh, and there is a discussion with him and Trevor Page uh, Lynn. Uh, and Trevor Plagen is uh, a cultural geographer who came out of Berkeley and is also an artist. Uh, look at that discussion, uh, but he's also, it, that, that there's a kind of connection to Glenn Greenwald, Laura Proitras, Edward Snowden, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, it, this, sh I, I'm sure people have got attitudes and uh, feelings about those particular figures. Uh, what I don't want you to do is to um, let those feelings cloud your appreciation uh, or intellectual engagement with this book. But I uh, nevertheless want you to think critically about his own positionality and the degree to which um, that is... Um, uh, 
that is at work here in what he has produced. Overall, uh, this is a very exciting book, uh, a very penetrating book, uh, and I think that um, while it may be challenging for you because of the language, and uh, it is available as an audio book, and it's, uh, I have to say, in, in listening to it, I found it very amusing to hear all of this uh, really wonderful academic language from an audio book, uh, a genre that I usually associate with, uh, let's say, Harry Potter or something like that. Um, so that was quite uh, interesting to hear, even though the audio book uh, uh, narrator uh, <laughs> provides us with a terrible um, way of pronouncing Foucault. Uh, he completely uh, mangles that. But um, the the issue uh, is that this this is a ter- this is a terrific book. So give it a chance. Really engage it. Read it. Reread it. Uh, and then kind of expand out. Look at his other book uh, and look at some of the other uh, works that he is engaging. Because I think you will get a lot out of it, and it's uh, it will provide you with real insight into the nature of uh, our world. Okay. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed uh, this discussion of the Theatre of Operations by Joseph Maskell.